you. Um, I, uh, about two months ago, I found myself on the comments section of YouTube, and uh, I was commenting, unfortunately, I was commenting on a, uh, a video about the famous Ayn Rand, or Ayn Rand, however you say it. And I posted underneath uh, against this woman's tirades against what is essentially the human race uh, that um, this monetary system seems to have no point and seems to actually hinder people and hinder progress. And uh, one of the uh, responses I got, and I didn't answer it, was, well, actually, money, money creates an incentive to invent the new items. That's the driving force behind it. And so what I would, thought I'd do, instead of answering on, a, t on, a, on a, you know, a, a YouTube comment, is organize a global awareness day uh, in being streamed in, I don't know, a few thousand countries, uh, in which to answer that with a, a, a graphically supported lecture. So that's what this is. <laughs> okay. The Zeitgeist Movement calls for and supports the urgent need for a transition out of our current debt and waste-based economic model into a truly sustainable, abundance-based, non-monetary, technologically advanced culture. As you might imagine, this is no easy task to communicate. Adopting a wider lens than single-issue organizations, we seek a transition out of the old folkways of global life into a new paradigm focused on global cooperation, a true appreciation for the value and role of our environment and the employment of science and technology for social concern above all else. There are, broadly speaking, two revolutions which need to occur in human society to meet this goal. One is the physical and technical one. As we approach the end of the coal and oil era, a global revamp of energy production and distribution is needed. As clean and drinkable water becomes scarce, systems need to be put in place to desalinate and purify water for human consumption. With the emergence of soilless agriculture and vertical farming, we can not only clean up food production, but also save vast amounts of space. And as we become an ever more global society, we must develop a new high-speed method of transport that is clean, safe, and globally unified. Unbelievably, that's the easy part. Another revolution that needs to occur involves the value system which we all share. It is the dominant cultural perspective which is shared by almost every society on Earth, despite perceived surface differences. Amongst these are attitudes to change and innovation, attitudes to resource use and consumption, the role of our society in the field of healthcare or public transportation or housing or anything that is a shared human attribute and service. It affects the first transition, as you will see, but it's the second transition I want to speak about today.
fear of the unknown. They are afraid of new ideas. They're loaded with prejudices, not based upon anything in reality, but based on if something is new, I reject it immediately because it's frightening to me. What they do instead is just stay with the familiar. You know, to me, the most beautiful things in all the universe are the most mysterious. On a cold boxing day in 1935, inventor Edwin Armstrong, standing atop the Empire State Building in front of his peers of the Institute of Radio Engineers, turned a dial on an old time radio. The familiar noise of static and interference, chopping and hissing as his dial skipped through the wavelengths, echoed out across the packed room. Suddenly, amid the noise, silence, as the radio locked onto a station so clear it appeared silent. Then a voice spoke on air. This is amateur radio station uh, 2Y2AG at Yonkers, New York, reporting on frequency modulation at two and a half meters. The voice and the subsequent sound of the water being poured into a glass, the sound of paper being crumpled, were all emanating from a studio 17 miles away and had been deliberately organized by Armstrong to demonstrate a brand new technology called frequency modulation, or FM, which he had discovered and patented four years previously. With clarity and immediate realism never before demonstrated or experienced in that medium, FM technology was the most obvious and beneficial user-impacting technology improvement since the invention of the entire radio technology. It is this reason we have high quality recordings in the BBC archives as far back as we do. It made radio more credible for the medium of music and it actually uses less power and generates less static for higher quality output. And perhaps the story should have ended there. Evidently the invention was a good thing, a general improvement of a widely shared system. However, uh, at the time uh, of his invention, Armstrong was working for RCA. RCA was one of only a few handfuls of companies that owned the thousand plus radio stations already running on the AM wavelength in 1935 in the United States. David Sarnoff, RCA's president and one of Armstrong's friends, had set Armstrong about the task of creating a filter for the static that had plagued AM technology. When Armstrong's discovery was demonstrated, Sarnoff commented, I thought Armstrong would invent some kind of filter to remove static from our AM radio. I didn't think he'd start a revolution, start up a whole damn new industry to compete with RCA. FM was a superior technology, but instead of embracing this technology, RCA's dominant profit earner was in AM, and Sarnoff saw to it that it would stay that way for as long as possible. In the words of Lawrence Lessing, Armstrong's biographer, the forces for FM, largely engineering, uh, could not overcome the weight of strategy devised by sales, patent and legal offices to subdue this threat to corporate position. For FM, if allowed to develop unrestrained, posed a complete reordering of radio power and the eventual overthrow of the carefully restricted AM system on which RCA had grown to power. Over the coming years, RCA barked on an anti-FM propaganda campaign. First, RCA kept the FM technology firmly under wraps, keeping it in-house and refusing to apply it to any of its business. In 1936, RCA went a step further and hired a former head of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to lobby the industry regulations into assigning FM to a spectrum that would essentially make it redundant and marginalized, despite its evident benefits to the medium of radio. Under the cloak of distraction afforded by the eruption of World War II, RCA's tactics gained traction. Soon after the war ended, the FCC announced a set of policies that would cripple any spread of FM technology. FM was deliberately assigned a marginalized spectrum. A motion was passed to ensure less electrical power was at the disposal of FM stations, making it impossible to beam long distance. 
which in turn forced FM stations to buy wired links from AT&T to maintain their geographical reach. Then RCA began incorporating FM technology into the emerging television market in which they had invested heavily. They declared Armstrong's patents invalid a full 15 years after Armstrong had originally registered them. RCA reneged on any and all royalties which were due to Armstrong, crippling him financially as they had previously crippled FM's technology by technical methods. A six-year patent lawsuit erupted with Armstrong on one side and RCA on the other. Armstrong was additionally met by lawsuits from other inventors. The legal action destroyed Armstrong financially. Finally, right as Armstrong's patents expired, therefore becoming of no financial support to him, RCA offered to settle for a fraction of what his legal costs were adding up to. Armstrong asked his wife for money. She refused. At the end of his rope, distraught, broken, mentally annihilated, Armstrong lashed out physically against his wife. They separated. Armstrong penned a brief note to her, and on a cold January morning in 1954, he stepped out of his 13th story window to his death. Ten years later, FM was the medium of choice for music stations. In the world that surrounds us today, our air is saturated with FM, and barring a few gestural honours in Armstrong's name, such as his induction into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. His name has now largely been forgotten, even though it was him that we always hear every time we turn the dial. Do you still listen to radio? I do. It's pretty good, isn't it? Armstrong's not alone in this. Galileo. Hailed as the father of modern science, one of the main minds which brought about the scientific revolution, like Joe said posited that the nature of the Earth's place in the universe was in a trajectory round the sun, a heliocentric viewpoint based on observed evidence. Clerics and philosophers, who by their nature have nothing useful to say on the subject, denounced him. He was the subject of the Inquisition, forced to recant his theory, and spent the remainder of his life under house arrest. Nikola Tesla, another great radio uh, inventor who invented wireless technology, uh, had, uh, two of, he has two of these stories himself. Tesla's invention of alternating current threatened Edison's empire of direct current. Uh, Edison even electrocuted an elephant with an alternating current to prove it was dangerous. She was called Topsy, and there's actually a video on the internet called Electrocuting an Elephant that Edison released uh, where he zaps this beast. Tesla, uh, second story. Tesla began a project in 1901 whose ultimate goal was to test the possibility of the supply of free energy the world over by wireless technology. He decided to build the Wardenclyffe Tower in Shoreham, Long Island for this experiment. Uh, when J.P. Morgan uh, learned of the project's funding, uh, uh, project's aim for wireless technology in abundance uh, to the point of being free, he asked, how can we get money from electricity which Tesla is supplying to every part of the world? The project's funding was withdrawn, the tower was torn down, and is now a historical site. Tesla died broke and alone in the New Yorker Hotel. Or perhaps you're Georg Cantor, a mathematician whose development of understanding of transfinite numbers makes him one of mathematics' big names today. His concept of different types of infinity was originally regarded as so counterintuitive, even shocking, that it in, encountered furious resistance from the mathematical contemporaries, while some Christian figures saw Cantor's work as a challenge to uh, God. He was described as a scientific charlatan, uh, a renegade, and even uh, a corrupter of youth. Yet, any mathematician today must be familiar with at least some of set theory and transfinite mathematics. Not all of them own toasters as well. A more striking example is that of Ignaz Semmelweis, a clinician in the first, quarter, uh, first half of the 19th century. After observing a statistical correlation between hospital workers who had handled cadavers in the morgue and then immediately afterwards had delivered live babies and the incidence of often pure peril fever or childbed fever in those delivered babies, Semmelweis posited that washing one's hands after touching a dead body might be a wise thing. By introducing hand washing, Semmelweis lowered the incidence of contamination below 1%, yet he was derided, and medical textbooks debunking his position were published, and then used as establishment material to educate new medical students against his idea. In 1861, in his book, Semmelweis lamented the slow adoption of his ideas in the medical community, while deaths resulting from the non-adoption of his, method, uh, his proven method continued. 
Most medical literature halls continue to resound with lectures on, on epidemic childbed fever and with discourses against my theories. The medical literature for the last 12 years continues to swell with reports of pure peril epidemics. And in 1854 in Vienna, the birthplace of my theory, 400 maternity patients died from childbed fever. In published medical works, my teachings are either ignored or attacked. The medical faculty at Würzburg awarded a prize to a monograph written in 1859 in which my teachings were rejected. It is perhaps no small irony that Semmelweis died in an insane asylum from septicemia, the very illness his discoveries would have helped cure. But Galileo and Armstrong are all part of a bygone era for us. Perhaps we can't relate because it's such a long time ago. Well, in the modern day, we have our own examples of this trend. This is Dr. Stanislav Bozinski, a Polish native doctor who practices in the States. A number of years ago, he discovered that individuals with cancer had very low amounts or a complete absence of certain heretofore undiscovered peptides in their blood and in their urine, theorizing that a reapplication of an isolated dose of these peptides might have an effect on tumors. He formed a treatment based, it, uh, based on them and tested it. Remarkably, uh, Bozinski's theory proved right. Among other achievements are uh, his first cures for normally incurable brainhood, uh, uh, childhood brainstem cancer, which traditional treatments had never successfully cured. Thus, Brzezinski's patented non-toxic treatment is the first paradigm-changing cancer treatment with serious effectiveness, which is owned by a man, not a pharmaceutical company. He's a real guy. Go and look him up. It is then perhaps no small surprise, given what we saw in Armstrong, Tesla, Semmelweis, and so on, that Brzezinski, instead of being funded, enabled, and celebrated, was vilified as a pee doctor, a quack, and a fraud. He was taken to the Texas Supreme Court six times, despite the acknowledgement in the court that the treatment was non-toxic, and even with the admission that the trials weren't even about the effectiveness of the treatment. The National Cancer Institute finally ran their own controlled trials on his treatment, watering down his recommended dosages 200 times so they wouldn't work. Just imagine if the $5 billion that were thrown annually at the cancer industry were even fractionally made available to doctors like Brzezinski. In the intervening years, Brzezinski is still battling to have his cancer treatment accepted. Meanwhile, one can only reflect on the untold lives cut short, slowly and violently, while the FDA and the Texas Medical Board, the guardians of the status quo, do everything they can to limit the spreading of a treatment they cannot profit from and for which only Brzezinski holds the patent. American consumers spend $90 billion annually on cancer treatments. Brzezinski's case is unusual in that he is still alive. Ladies and gentlemen, this leads me to conclude that we do not live in an advanced society. And with this small percentage of examples uh, examined, what are the governing mechanisms that prohibit paradigm shifts within society, be they technological, ideological, or cultural? Having established their root causes, what is the change that needs to occur in our attitude? And how does that change in our attitude to what is important then change the social structures we're surrounded by? The goal is to expose the underlying mechanisms that govern this pattern. We are quite certain it's not dictated by RCA's David Sarnov, or the medical practitioners of Zemmelweis's day, or of Brzezinski's, or of, the, uh, of Galileo's ruling church fathers. These individuals are also players on this stage, their actions aligning with an unspoken set of values generated by the nature of the common landscape in which they have found themselves across the ages. We need to adopt a wider lens that includes economics, social and cultural theory, and an understanding of how human society develops in an information age. I'll focus on three main limiters, three blocks that interfere with the smooth and emergent development in a society. In identifying these, we will start to lay bare the train of thought we need to reassess our current society. The most obvious, which relates particularly to Edwin Armstrong and Tesla, is the profit-supportive behaviours of any and all established institutions, not the particular CEOs or those who would flip the kill switch on any new advent like David Sarnov of RCA essentially did, but the dominant market forces of the companies and institutions which they represent and which give rise to their need for their positions. As uh, John McMurtry puts it, Behind the selection and development of technology's advances over every step of its planning, design, assembly, manufacture, and displacement of past ways of life stands one commanding value decision to maximize the difference between input and output of money demand in market investment sequences. In other words, 
if the technological advent, A, has the potential or even short-term negative retroaction on money output, B, it is selected against by a company or by the market or by a person as a matter of pure economic survival. This is true of any society based on monetary requirements to survive, and we call it competitive deselection. In other words, sorry, needless to say, any revision to a company's offering would require heavy restructuring, heavy staff turnover and retraining, and true innovation, uh, therefore, inevitably he heavy investment. Let me see, there we go. Uh, would be in the short term, uh, in many cases, a costly or negative effect upon the balance sheet, given that many companies' results are often uh, offered quarterly and have an immediate impact on the share price if they're below the expected maximised money output to input ratio. The dominant market ideology has to select against a ground up remodelling of the market offering to avoid this negative effect upon its stock. Equally, this is, of course, uh, true of technologies or market behaviours from outside the company, which may threaten the normal way in which said company would be able to generate revenues, even if it has a positive uh, force upon society. Anything that changes or threatens your business is considered a problem. Innovation is the enemy of established institutions. Quite a simple way of putting that. So, when digital downloads provide a more beneficial and efficient means of content distribution than prior hardware, it is supposed it is opposed and criminalised. Despite the speed of ease, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the size uh, that you, you, know, you can consume, uh, ease of access by anyone with a computer, savings in plastic, uh, transportation, storage, the dominant music companies sue individuals for criminality and lobby the government for protection of their industry, judging this to be the best way to guard their profits. Thereby, they hope to scare the rest of the consumer base into sticking with what is best for the established market. Not because they're evil, it's their job. It's the survival of those employed in that market. They stick with the familiar. Even more starkly, should a solution for a problem come to the floor that would cancel the need for an existing service that hitherto only treated or ra uh, rather than solved the problem in question, it is shunted to the side, often by employing the full force of law propaganda. This all too often falls into the hands of advertising. Bottled water is a quick fix with recurring profits for water companies, while desalination and purification plants that would enable an abundance of water for all humanity and all uses is considered a risk to business rather than what it actually is, a necessity for survival. In turn, we produce more plastic waste, which is then measured in the positive light of units manufactured and sold, rather than their actual effect, a pollution detriment and an increased footprint caused by the treatment of the problem. The end effect of this market lock mentality is not really hard to discern. You cannot set in motion long-term thinking in a system which rewards short-term behaviours. While human beings have to support themselves from the monetary profit of their enterprises, no matter how decoupled these enterprises are from producing something uh, that is useful or the harm on basic life organisation to the environment, short-term wins every time. There is no money in solutions or learning to produce and consume less. For either you lose too much money and you're removed from the position you're in, or you are ostracized completely as were our doomed engineers. The system's overriding logic is to deselect the non-profit maximizing solution for we cannot afford to tolerate it in a system that discerns the metrics for positive growth in the factors of higher consumption, higher profits, more units shifted. The first limiter then is established, market lock. The innovation that threatens established institutions are criminalised, ignored, hamstrung and suppressed by the established institutions whose market value would be, even if only temporarily, slowed or curbed by their adoption. This is regardless of how effective, efficient or beneficial these innovations are or would be in a society adopting them. In fact, the more beneficial, advancing uh, or efficient the new development would be, the more it is pushed back by the elements of society that would be within the sphere of its influence. Second limiter to innovation and its progress lies a little more deeply within the societal mindset uh, than the monetary paradigm, and it's just as invisible. Uh, this is one we like to call mind lock. 
this is the tendency alluded to by, by Dr. Wayne Dyer in his address that you heard in that portion of Pixar's Day and Night, and which is also keenly expressed once again by John McMurtry. When people come to examine any way of life in the world, they are conditioned not to expose their own social order to that same critical eye with which they view a different or opposed social order. This is because they identify with their own way of life as normality, and thus the other as abnormality. If the other is not only different, but also opposed to the home order, then to abnormality is added the offence of enmity. Given that there is such an abundance of examples of systemic failure in society, why have we not easily moved beyond it? The question comes down to more than just money as a powerful barrier that it is. Societal self-analysis is not built into our psyche. It is an irreversible option in our critique of planetary life. We do not like to talk of how our society might be less than perfect. We don't even like those who criticize our football teams. Uh, tell someone that their social system is geared towards something other than complete chest-swelling awesomeness, and you're often told that if you don't like it, you can just get it out. It's the social theory version of, well, I think you're a dick. Yeah, it's like that. Normal is normal. Normal can't be what could be said to be uh, nece uh, necessary for scrutiny. As we look outwards from our societal perspective, uh, we do not factor in the preconditions of convention and uh, presuppositions which have been arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily born and raised into. What is normality? You were all born at 1,044 miles an hour the rotational speed of the Earth. <laughs> Yet you believe you're static sitting in those chairs right there. When you stand up, you're actually standing outwards. Downwards is actually inwards. The sun doesn't set or rise. We're at a different position in the universe every single minute. It appears then that we can get used to just about anything. This then is what I mean by normality. Much of society appears pretty much normal to its inhabitants and therefore natural or inevitable, not begging questions. What is considered by any of us to be mundane or a given becomes mundane or a given only by repetition. And whatever we are always surrounded by defaults to that status. A few years ago, a television program traded on this uh, possibility of showing an unaccustomed culture confronted by a modern city system, uh, what we've, the viewer would consider normal and unsurprising. By dropping a culturally unprepared group of Amish people into a modern high-tech city environment where they're confronted by vending machines and escalators, the show's attempt at exposing the humorous response of culture shock and societal unpreparedness actually underlines a very deeper uh, issue of general custom. The culture shock is a product of a non-initiated standpoint and becomes at once surprising and almost unbelievable. One can't imagine an unknowing fear of an escalator's basic operation. Even my daughter loves playing with them. For one has never not been used to them. Additionally, we tend to assume that our societal level of trust and coherence exists that would uh, mean that dangerous architecture or hazardous, uh, hazardous obstacles are minimized. Therefore, we uh, trust that escalators will not mangle us, that lifts will not plummet 18 floors suddenly, that any household item will uh, not explode when used. There we go. Um, or plugged in. And that our house will not collapse uh, when we are... Uh, sorry. Uh, when we are about to open the front door. Over and above these general trust and belief systems and established cultural aspects is the established values which operate and which are also bought into with the same level of trust as the physical ones. Amongst them may be the following. The army are fighting for my freedom. Surveillance is for the provision of safety. Advertising is a means to educate me, for example, about the best way of looking after my health, and so on. Amongst them, uh, more often than not, is also the general value that it's highly unlikely to me that the values of the surrounding social order are or would be harmful, misleading, predatory, or detrimental to me and my fellow inhabitants. For to believe that uh, the values are out of order would be to appear to be rather paranoid and what is tellingly called antisocial. There must be something wrong with you if you don't support the structure and find it predatory. After all, that's not what a society is about, is it? 
What we consider to be our values are in fact arbitrary conditioning byproducts of on one extreme, which evolve out of our need to feel perpetually, uh, we, our, 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 sorry, our need not to feel perpetually worried and surprised and disorientated by the regularly appearing environment and cultural attributes. And on the other extreme are deliberately reinforced by the dominant perspective of the ruling social order. As Dr. Gabor Maté puts it, what you have to understand about an intellectual culture of a society uh, is that it actually reflects the power interest in that society, the dominant perspective. And built right into the dominant value structure is the taboo of questioning the authority by which it is delivered. Fear of the unknown and fear of ostracism ensure that the advent of new opinions, new realizations, or anything that is new at all is met with discomfort, fear, even anger. And it's true of every existing society to get today. Again, McMurtry, this block against exposing the habituated and socially constructed self, and more deeply the regulating order which has constructed it, is a transcultural problem. Here is our second limiter to add to the first market lock. Resting within and under the market system shared by most of this planet is the culture blindness of basic societal functional analysis, our values, the mind lock. It is the inability and ill-equipped nature to understand how the system is operating around us and how our views are being informed by it. Third and finally, there is the sphere of education, something which Jim Phillips has dealt with in the applied sense. By education, I don't simply mean school, university, and grades, and cheating, but also the methods of the distribution of information that exist within a society, including schools, universities, television, radio, internet-based media, films and documentaries, books, printed materia, conversations, and so on. Education, in my sense, is the systemic assimilation and distribution of information within a society. The furthering of any knowledge and its modification, adjustment, development, and redistribution. It is what you learn from the daily interaction with that society, whether it's through a concerted and defined institution like a school, or personal endeavor like a book or a science kit, or leisure, uh, be it what you are told by others or by television programs, what they display to you. As James Phillips has dealt with in his uh, lecture a bit more, more detailed, education is often believed to be somehow separate from culture, a supra-societal, free of the biases of tradition, myth, and so on. Whereas, in fact, education is in many of its areas a product of culture. One need only to really read a history book written under communist rule or the modern American school system to witness this bias. Not only are the teachers, journalists, and uh, authors and so on, all victims of that culture, but the syllabus of an institution born of a traditional society with set doctrines is itself a machine that pumps out information well below the rate of actual advance that the society experiences, which is, as discussed, already hindered by the previously discussed mechanism of market lock, and so on. Look only to Zemmelweis's experience of how his discoveries were dealt with by the established colleges. The dominant educational model often implicitly supports the ruling value system. It is the dominant perspective. Thus, schools which produce well-adjusted citizens and well-rounded individuals are in fact producing individuals which are adjusted to the flaws and presuppositions of that society. As Jiddu Krishnamurti put it, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. At the same time, the place of uh, systems of knowledge, learning and research and inquiry must stand at the forefront of such a society if we're able to gather such feedback in a cohesive, meaningful way. If we are to progress, these systems must be open and freely available for all to access. The issues we see in the stories we've discussed and what we see in the world come from restricted access, from blocking and compartmentalizing pre-existing areas of culture or of information. This, if we are able to progress, must be overthrown. And if you think about it, there is no actual way of successfully cooperating and working together if we continue the practice of ownership, because ownership presupposes non-cooperation. There is already a value program, an attitude, a practice that fits this bill. With the necessity of proof, testing, self-awareness, and self-critical analysis, the scientific method is the method by which we can serve and update our society. Its reference are in the physical world, not the opinion of some politician, nor the folkways of industry, nor the traditions of a religion. As you look around in this room, I'd ask you to become mindful of the things which the scientific method has actually given us. My voice is audible. I have something called slides which underline my point. We sit on and in constructed edifices and wear clothes that are all the result of technical uh, processes. Indeed, many of us are alive because of science. 
Had I been born with medical technology set back 100 years, I would most likely not be speaking to you today. Now, it must be made clear that the scientific method is not the same as some elements of the modern scientific establishment. Indeed, the horrors, inefficiencies, slowness to adapt, and other attributes previously mentioned are the results of the interference of the dominant cultural value set, set with the attempts of the scientific method. The results are systematically downgraded and diluted scientific landscape. If the scientific method were the act of running, we are currently running underwater. Rather, it is the system attributes of the scientific method themselves that, when promoted to the overriding value orientation of society, will yield a system where efficiency and sustainability are promoted and where the obsolescence and waste generating mechanism of present day life are deselected in favour of those processes that take care of every human being well beyond what we would believe actually possible in a market system based on competition, inefficiency, tradition, and so on. Many people consider this to be cold and unfeeling. Well, if using science to solve our social issues sounds cold to you, you may want to consider this. You employ the scientific method every day. Placing one foot in front of the other will enable you to walk forwards. Having learned this, and that it's generally a good idea to face forward, you employ this method because of the results you have come to get from that. You know that turning a door handle and either pushing or pulling near the door will enable you to pass through. Nobody attempts to simply walk through a closed door uh, because of the environmental feedback from testing it uh, that has resulted in the proven knowledge that it is an unsuccessful practice and the cause of many, many headaches, at least for me. The most metaphysically orientated minds will still interact with the physical world in the way that the human body requires and is able to. It is a physical referent in that sense that drives every action. This is why we propose a resource-based economy. Money is not scientific. It's made up. It no longer works as a positive force in society. Instead, dividing, blocking and usurping human ingenuity that has been present since the absence of money as a motivational force. Tesla didn't do it for the money. Armstrong wasn't a radio genius since his, team, his teens because of the money. Galileo didn't do it for the money. Martin Luther King didn't do it for the money. If you're only doing it for the money, it's probably not worth doing to begin with. Okay? Using what science and technology can truly offer us, we will evolve beyond the need for money. And with it, we will free ourselves from the inefficiencies, debt, slavery, and tendencies towards manipulation that the present system's faulty self-analysis puts down to human nature and the way things are. In fact, we're already evolving beyond the need for money anyway, or at least our ability to maintain it usefully within society. We have in the last 50 years automated phone operators, while massively increasing phone operator services. We have automated bank telepositions, and you're telling me we're taking less money out now? People actually forget there is even once a job called a bank teller, and were those guys, those token ones in, in Barclays, not there anymore, you'd forget it immediately because they're not necessary. Um, we've got rid of the lift operator. He doesn't exist anymore. No, nor does the ice man, thanks to the refrigerator. Blockbuster and similar stores are basically going out of business because of online DVD services, largely automated, as are entirely automated DVD machines. This alone will do away with the entire concept of money, a system which is now resulting in poorly applied technologies, stunted innovation, death and destruction, not to mention the social ills of poverty, crime, and gaming for advantage. In a society based on the scientific method, applied for social concern, we do away with vague human opinion in the operation of society. I don't care what David Sarnoff may think of FM technologies, or what a large pharmaceutical company thinks about Stanislav Brzezinski's treatment of cancer. If the science works, it stays. If it is one day surpassed by better methods, it goes. End of. No politicians, no voting, no straw polls, no vox pop interviews with people who do not know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> It is the election of ideas that we're in desperate need of. If we are to survive in the most abundant, enjoyable, safe, free and fair society we can possibly create at any given moment. And I will just say about that freedom. This is one of the big things that we're going to face. Is, you're affecting my freedom with your new system. 
Okay, you don't have any freedom whatsoever other than laws of nature. Sorry, that's the way it goes. And any society that affords you new freedoms, it's because of the architecture of that society. Not something that was written down on an old piece of paper that people pay money to go and see, or any of that rubbish. It's the, it's the architecture of the society you're in. Okay, just remember that. Because people are going to bring it up to you all the time. And if science has taught us anything, it has taught us that working together is better than working alone or against each other. We can be so wonderfully achieving were the world simply to stop, look around, assess the situation, look at our tools, take stock of what resources are left and where, and fight the common enemy. And the enemy we all face now is what our culture is doing to us. It's the stage we are setting for our own destruction. Should we not reform our society and base it on resource management enabled through the scientific tools that we have? These are our three limiters. The market itself is the determiner of the options you see in society. The forces of profit, competition and ownership. The mind lock, our second limiter, blocks our ability to assess our market lock the way things are within a wider context, what Will would call a new frame. And our education, including the media and every other available source of information, informs both the ability to think and our ability to act on one side and represents, promotes and governs the discourse of the market on the other side in the form of propaganda. Combined, they are the overarching lock mechanism. They are the three bars on our prison cell window. The, is it up there? It took me a while to find that. Many of them don't have three anymore. The social model we promote contravenes the need for these limiters based on the understanding that strategically serving every human is to our individual and collective advantage by using our only proven tools, the scientific method and our knowledge of technology. Everything else is just whistling past the graveyard. A couple of months ago I was debating on how to end this talk other than by just telling you to join the movement and uh, here's something that I actually took from Charlie Veach when he was on V Radio. Are you here still Charlie? He's gone, okay, fine. I'll send this to him. <laughs> he, said, he said something about fractals, and I, I, I only vaguely knew what a fractal was. So, bear with me. This is a fractal. Some of our doomed engineers even worked on them. Gail Cantor's work actually led partially to the understanding of fractals and, uh, that we have today. It's a mathematically generated image, in some cases, which is self-similar. That means that any one portion will at least approximately resemble the whole if zoomed in on. It is infinitely scalable, either up or down, and the shape will reach a point eventually where the constituent part will look the same as the whole. In turn, the shape forms uh, one of the constituent parts for a larger self-similar object. We even see these patterns in nature. Romanesco broccoli is sort of a big kind of thing that goes up, but it's also made of other things, and they are made of other things. Yeah, the constituent parts, basically. The veins of a leaf are nice and easy to understand. Uh, a fern is composed of self-similar portions. Each self-similar portion also uh, composed of other self-similar uh, portions. What about an atom? Uh, an atom is a nucleus surrounded by electrons which circle and orbit. The Earth uh, is orbited by a moon. In turn, the sun uh, is orbited by multiple bodies in space. Solar systems orbit a center to become galaxies. The orbiting bodies are all made of their constituent parts, all with their own orbits and orbiters. Change a portion of the constituent part and the whole shape changes. Change the whole and the constituent parts change as well. Of course, when you witness a change in a fractal, one has to decide whether the change came from the constituent part or the whole. Perhaps it's a little bit of both. Gail Cantor didn't go into it. I would like you for a second to evaluate your actual position in this world. You are an individual in a collective whole, a cog in a societal frame, yet your individuality is a supportive mirror of the values of your system, whatever those values are. In that sense, you're a portion of a fractal society. It reflects you and you reflect it. And as we begin to assess our society from the true perspective, the overarching perspective, the global perspective. Perhaps you, like me, can entertain the fractal metaphor. One person can change their mind. Several people can change the mood. But a whole world of people changing their minds changes the world. Thank you.